All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Elevate Your Grind, brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales, and it is lovely to be here with you folks today. Uh, this is our third episode back since we had our little hiatus because I am a busy, busy man these days. But I'm very excited. We had some awesome guests. Um, I'm assuming that you all will see this after the other two come out because that just seems to make logical sense. So I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Max Simon, as well as Angela Anzalone from Cush Rewards, two very different folks on two very different side of the industries, but as always, great conversations. Uh, coming up this month, later this week, I'm assuming, again, folks, I'm recording this on the uh, 15th. I assume it's going to come out in about five days. So hopefully you see this by the 23rd will be uh, we have a live Zoom pre presentation, which is legacy and corporate sitting down at the table together. We've got an amazing panel. I'm sorry, that's not that panel. On the 23rd, we have cannabis, crypto and NFTs, how Web3 is going to integrate into the cannabis world. That's going to be an amazing panel hosted by our own VJ Choksi. Check that out on 323. It's going to be at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then, of course, we have the awesome C-Lab annual conference, which will be coming up on June 3rd and 4th at Mana and Wynwood. I've said this once. I've said it 100 times, folks. That conference kicked off my career in cannabis. If you are looking to get into the industry, if you're in the industry, it will be an amazing conference. Maybe I'll try to drag today's guest over to Florida to be a, a speaker at the conference. So with that being said, folks, we're messing with some new camera angles. So I hope whoever edits this video has not shown you who my guest is today. But if they have, well, then you know. So please welcome my guest today from True Leave, Nicole Stanton, the VP and General Counsel. Nicole, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Todd. And I, I'm coming to the C-Lab. I will be a, a guest panelist. See, this is, they don't give me these kind of memos now. Now I just look weird, but no, I mean, I'll be very excited to meet you in person. It is a great, it is a great conference and truly has been a huge, huge supporter of it. So Nicole, we kind of talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but truly is now giant. You guys are everywhere. The acquisitions that, that have happened and they acquired you. And I think it was probably an amazing acquisition in that but they're really making some moves right now. So just to kind of give everyone some background, you were part of the Harvest team and you worked with TrueLeave on the merger and now you work with TrueLeave as the combined company. You know, how? let's talk about this. You know, there are a lot of legal minds in cannabis. I'm sure when you started out in the legal world, if anything, if you were going to be involved in cannabis, you might be defending people. Did you ever think that you would be leading the regulatory and compliance and, and m a and everything else side for a not just a cannabis company but one of the largest in the world no todd in fact if you had told me that about five years ago i probably would have laughed in your face um i was at a big law firm doing litigation at that firm and i really wasn't looking to leave so if you had told me this five years ago i would have laughed in your face so so what pulls so i mean again i i don't know the legal world i haven't worked there but to me you know, it, it looks like you start out in, in one of those, maybe a public defender job and you, you try to get a landmark case and you, the, the goal is to get to the private sector from what I understand is you want to do what you're doing and you want to, and, and get to the big firm. What pulled you into the world of cannabis? Well, so in 2019, I, again, I was at a big law firm and I'd been there for about 20 years and I was looking for something else to do. And I'd actually applied for a position at a nonprofit and I came in second place for that position. Um, I had made up my mind that I was leaving a big law firm. And so one of my friends who had been helping me with a job search said, hey, how would you like to be general counsel at a company? And I said, it would depend on the company and it would depend on the people that I'm working with. So he introduced me to the CEO of Harvest at the time, Steve White, who was also a recovering lawyer and uh, met him, met the members of the legal team and decided that it was something that I wanted to give a try to. I hadn't been doing any cannabis work at the firm. Um, the firm was doing some cannabis work, but I wasn't working on those clients. Got it. So it, was all, it was all new to me. So brand new, jumping your foot and you know, jumping with both feet into the cannabis space. I mean, you had to be a hell of a lawyer for them to bring you on with no cannabis experience because it is one of the, the, the most complicated as I understand it, regulatory environments that we have. Every state, state to state is different. Municipality to municipality is different. What kind of law were you doing before this? Did it, did it translate over? 
Well, I was a, I was a litigation attorney. So if, with any given case, mm. you have to learn whatever the subject matter is. And so for me, learning cannabis was just like I had been doing on various cases. I mean, I represented lawyers in malpractice cases. I represented dairy farms. I mean, you name it, I had represented it. So you have to learn something new each time you start a new case, unless you're doing the same type of case over and over. And that wasn't my practice. I had a, a very wide variety of clients. See, that's it's funny because it sounds like you're doing quite the opposite now where you, you had the wide variety of clients. Every day was probably so different. Every case was mm -hmm. so different. And, and I feel, you know, there are certain people in the world that they thrive off that. They thrive off that randomness and and expanding their mind and everything else. Was it a little bit of an adjustment for you to come into the, to the world of harvest? And it was just, I don't want to say the same thing over and over again, because as you opened up new states, I'm sure it changed. But are you getting bored or, or is this actually really fun for you? <laughs> no way I'm getting bored. Um, oftentimes what we do at True Leaf, formerly Harvest, now True Leaf, has never been done before. I mean, our merger of the two companies is a perfect example of that. We, of course, had to get regulatory approval in every single state where we had licenses. And some of the ways that we had to do that just had never been done before. And so, you know, even members of the legal team, we were working on it, obviously. We didn't know if, if some of the ideas that we had were going to work or not, but thankfully they did. I don't think very many people expected that large of a transaction to close that quickly. And so it's something that I'm hugely proud of the team that I worked with, um, enabling them to do, you know, something that had never been done before that quickly. What's crazy to me is, you know, I've known Truly for a while being in Florida. This is where Truly started and, and, and candidly dominated and continues to dominate with hundred and something store. I mean, if you go on the OMM, OMMU, you guys sell like 60% of the cannabis in Florida, right? Um, and, and in most places, you know, True Leave is the only dispensary that people have access to. It's funny, I looked at True Leave and I saw some ancillary dispensaries in some other states that they got licensing for. And in my head, I'm like, oh, that that's kind of a cool strategy. They're going to avoid California. They'll build up their brand elsewhere. And at some point, they'll enter California and, and attack that market. Because to me, and I don't know if you feel the same way, I feel like to be taken seriously as a cannabis company, like you have to have some kind of competition in, in California. You have to exist there. You have to, especially for us as a brand, like, so, you know, with me, with Heisman, like we have to compete in California because you have to have that California weed stamp on you. As a retailer, you guys did a very good job, I think on the medical side of things, and then are doing a really good job starting to transition and bringing on those right brands to we'll call it be prepared for rec in Florida because you are the legal mind. And I can't say that we're a rec state that requires a medical license, but I will say that you don't have to. So all of a sudden I remember logging in, I want to say LinkedIn and I saw the merger and I'm like, okay, this makes sense. And you know, if truly was going to go after somebody or, or even if, if harvest wanted to expand the two of you together, it really just made sense to have dominant markets in both California and Florida, I imagine that had to be some of the draw from the harvest side was was the Florida footprint of True Live and, and you guys just being really good California operators. Well, I mean, I think I think you're missing a state, and I think it's the state where I happen to be physically located. And I think you mean it's the state that came out of nowhere and all of a sudden is the second largest <laughs> cannabis market in the country. That state that that everyone else forgot about. Yep, that one. <laughs> So, I mean, Arizona, of course, is a perfect example of what you're talking about, a medical market that was a medical market as of November 2020, and by January 2021 was a rec market. I mean, through a voter initiative, it became a recreational uh, adult use state, and I give major, major props to the regulator here in Arizona for taking a ballot initiative that passed in November and by January, being able to turn on the switch. I mean, it was really, I think it's the, probably the fastest one that has ever happened and may hold the record for quite a long time. It was unprecedented. Are, are you throwing shade at New York and New Jersey right now? I feel like that's what you're doing. <laughs> I, would never, I would never do that. I would never. I like regulators in all states, Todd. Same, all of course states. we do. But <laughs> no, it, it, it's funny because you look in New York and New Jersey, are obviously two states that a lot of people want to be on. But you look and it's like, okay, what's going on there? nothing's changed. Well, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. And then I keep saying them threatened to, 
to light up. And they're like, New Jersey is about to open up its billion dollar cannabis industry. I'm like, yeah, sure. And the Safe Banking Act is going to pass as well, too. Let me know when that happens. So, but it, you're right. Arizona came out of nowhere. So I remember when we were doing the business plan, I'm like, God, I, I probably need to stop giving out all this, this Heisman information. It just comes to me naturally that Arizona wasn't, it wasn't in my top markets yet, just because you know, there had been some more mature cannabis markets that had just made the flip. I didn't really have a whole lot of brand data. And then all of a sudden, you know, we go and it ends 2021. And I look and I'm like, wait a second, look at these sales. This is ridiculous. You guys are all over the place there. And then on top of that, as a sports minded brand, I'm sure you're excited about this. You're also hosting the Super Bowl next year too, mm -hmm. in Arizona. So I imagine Harvest has a few plans for that to take advantage of it. Yeah, I mean, so uh, more to come, of course, but we do have a dispensary that will be opening in close proximity to where the Super Bowl, uh, not the game will be taking place, but the activities will be taking place in downtown Phoenix. So, you know, we're of course going to take advantage of whatever happens to come in Arizona. Normally we have spring training, didn't happen this year because of the lockout, but mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty great state. Yeah, no, it is a great state. I actually have a few friends who just got back there from a golf trip. And it's funny, a friend of mine, it's like, hey, I'm going to Arizona. What are the laws out there? I'm like, full wreck, buddy. Have fun. So, um, but what what do you think it was <laughs> yeah, that, that, what was that? What do you I think? I said, it, have a good time in Arizona. Yeah, well, I need to get myself out there and try products as well. Um, call that research and development. But what do you think? What do you think it was in Arizona that took you guys from, I think it was like, I, I know you're in the top 10. I want to say it was like eight or nine to all of a sudden number two within a year. Like it went, I want to say from, I'm making this up like $800,000, $900,000 or $800 million, $900 million to, you know, over a few, I think you ended the year at like 1.2, 1.4 billion, or I could be grossly under guessing that I'm just kind of making it up based on the fact that I knew Colorado. No, cause Colorado was at like 2 billion. So it must've been in the twos. Now I'm rambling, but you guys went from a few hundred million to, uh, you know, 1.2, 1.4, 2 billion. I don't think your population grew that much. So what do you think it was? Was it just that they were waiting for rec to happen for those sales to come in? Yeah, I mean, obviously that was a game changer for everyone. And like I said, I mean, being able to turn on the switch that quickly, you really can't, I mean, there's not too much you can say about that. It, like I said, it was unprecedented. Arizona has a very business-minded regulator. I mean, certainly we are regulated as an industry here, um, but I think it's, it's smartly regulated. Um, it's not over-regulated by any stretch of the imagination. And so again, major, major props to the regulator here. How did the taxes? Tend to not, let me back up, Todd. I would say we were ready for it as a company. Um, you know, you have to have product in order to be able to do that. And I think Harvest at the time, obviously this was pre-merger. I mean, Harvest smartly positioned itself to be able to have the capacity to do that and, and be responsive to the demand. I mean, otherwise you just have stores that you could have customers come into and there'd be nothing to buy. I mean, we were, we were obviously preparing for that um, with polling data that showed that the initiative was likely going to pass. And so you have to, you have to anticipate that. We certainly didn't know it was going to, the switch was going to be turned on as quickly as it was, but we were, we were ramping up production and capacity in hopes that that was going to happen. Very cool. Did anyone, I mean, from the consumer side, obviously the, one of the biggest complaints in, in the state of California is the taxes that consumers have to pay. So, you know, you're looking at like 30, 33% ish tax on whatever you buy. And it's funny, it took me a little while to figure that out. My first few trips to California, you know, I'd add up the, the price of everything in my head and be like, all right, 250, that's not bad. And then I get to the register like $400, sir. And I'm like, wait, wait, no. I'm like, I know I'm not good at math, but I'm not that bad, you know? going from a medical market, it's quote unquote, not really taxed. And then you have the recreational market where it is. I mean, what are the taxes like in Arizona? Was that a hard pill for some, some people to swallow, you know, that maybe let their med cards expired because they didn't want to stay in that program and do medical, you know, I know how it is in Colorado, but was that a hard transition for people to, to swallow those taxes associated with cannabis now? 
I mean, not, not in Arizona, no, because you do have the option to keep your medical card. And I would say we have not seen a significant drop in medical customers, medical you know, patients that have their card. Um, if you want to walk into a store without a medical card, you pay a 16% tax here. And so um, you can avoid that by having a medical card. So I think a lot of people are maintaining their medical cards. They are true medical patients. Um, if you don't want to have a medical card, you can pay the 16% tax. Yeah. So you have the option here. So it's interesting. So, you know, Arizona came out of, I don't want to say nowhere, because obviously you guys prepare for it behind the scenes. We look at a state like Florida and, you know, the unfortunate part is I don't think there's much legislation on the table right now to take it recreational. You know, you guys have obviously insider information that I don't considering, you know, there, there are packs and everything else involved, but I look at the state of Florida in that same year that Arizona was like nine or eight, nine or 10, uh, Florida was three or four at $1.2 billion. And at the time when we did that revenue, we only had 450 to 500,000 medical patients that were registered in the state of Florida. Now, as I understand it, it's a couple closer to seven or 800,000 now, but the state of Florida has over 30 million people in it, right? So when you look at our right. state, if we can get off our ass and, and change it to recreational, I mean, can you even tell us what kind of ballpark numbers you guys are estimating for what this market's going to look like as a whole? When you have, you know, half a million people who can legally be allowed to buy weed, even if they're maxing out their recs every month and buying it for their friends, there's still only 500,000 people that can buy an ounce a month or two ounces a month. They can't do more than that. It's not legally possible. And if they're getting it out the back door, it's not being tracked in that system anyway. So not saying that that's happening, but no matter what anybody wants to tell me about illegal stuff going on, well, if it's happening illegal, it's not being tracked. So when you look at a state like Arizona and the population and what you did before and prior, what are your estimates on what Florida is going to look like? And I know this is not a legal question, but just, you know, the markets, what do you think this market's going to be like once it it is able to go full rec and there are 30 million people that could potentially purchase cannabis plus the amount of tourists that we get here every year. Yeah. I mean, you're right. I'm not a numbers person and I, I won't even play one on TV because <laughs> I'm a lawyer. We're terrible with numbers, but I mean, you look at Arizona again, you take it back to Arizona and you extrapolate it out and it, it's significant, um, especially given the number of outlets retail outlets, retail establishments that we have in Florida, um, to say it's a game changer is a complete understatement. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. Um, how many, so not only that, but truly was also able or not able, but they also absorbed the, the, I think harvest had what, like 26 stores when you guys had your Florida license. Yeah. So I mean, we had, I don't know if it was 26, it wasn't probably quite that many, but we of course had stores in Florida. Some of those in, in duplicative cities, we probably closed some locations that were duplicative with what Truly had, or we kept the Harvest Store if it was a more attractive location. So some of that, you know, it didn't all cross over, but but some did. Very cool. So, I mean, so at, as the combined entity of Truly and Harvest, you guys have a really amazing United States footprint, right? Um, I think you have two mm -hmm. And I'm, I apologize not being on the West Coast. I don't know the reputation for the flower that Harvest puts out, but I've always heard good things about the store. And honestly, I think, I don't remember if it was Santa Monica or Venice, but your store in that area from everybody that I know is one of the best, if not the best in, in, in an area that I truly love. Um, I think the retail reputation that you guys have is amazing. At this point in time, you know, is the focus looking to do some of the things that I see in the news and bring on these banner California and other state brands to, to round out your portfolio in the states that don't have them? I mean, I see deals going with with Khalifa Kush and Connected and you've had Blue River, I know truly have had Blue River for the longest time. You know, is, is that one of the main strategies was now that that truly slash harvest and we'll call it truly. I just I miss the harvest name so bad. And I know I, I can say that. Um, even the yellow color was really nice too. Um, so, but saying that, you know, is, is the goal now? To I, I, I will say Todd, I look, I look, I look a lot better in green, so I'm actually okay with the yellow going by the way. So. <laughs> you have some good swag, truly. I got a bunch of it around my house. So, um, 
Yeah, I it, Kim wears a lot of garnet and gold, though. She is a Florida State alumni, but um, where is I going? Yeah, so is the goal now that you have this great reputation established as, as a retailer and a dependable retailer of cannabis, is it going out and, and partnering and finding a lot of those marquee brands that's going to round out the portfolio in other states? Yeah, I mean, you probably, you you follow us, obviously, and so you see us doing those strategic brand uh, partnerships where it makes sense um, in different markets. And I think, you know, California is not 100% new to True Leave. I think they had a Palm Springs store there before the Harvest acquisition. But Harvest certainly has a had a larger California footprint there. And um, so I'm sure, you know, that, that the various brands in California will be evaluated in, in due time. That's not something that I participate in as members of, we paper up the contracts for the brands, but um, don't have a lot of involvement in selection. Mm-hmm. So I'm probably not the best person to talk to about that one. <laughs> have, have the stores on the West Coast been rebranded? The Arizona stores have not been rebranded. Um, on the California ones, I don't know if all of those have or not. I know the Arizona ones have not. I mean, because as you pointed out, Harvest has a very strong brand in Arizona. And so I think, you know, time will tell about when that happens. No, it's really cool. I mean, it's funny. You guys almost have like an East Coast, West Coast thing going on where True Leave is known in the East Coast and Harvest is known in the West Coast, except instead of it being a rap battle, you guys are, are a merged company. So it's just two powerful entities <laughs> spanning the coast. You guys are like the uh, White Castle slash Crystal Burger, you know, same company, same burgers, <laughs> North and South. Um, well, and I, I, I think you, Todd, you hit on it like early in this conversation, which was it was a merger that made a lot of sense. Giving, given the footprint of the two respective companies. And so, you know, I think we're stronger together than we were independently. I definitely think that. So, you know, we had mentioned New York and New Jersey. And, and again, I know, I believe you guys have presence in Pennsylvania, but I mean, is the goal of the combined company now really, we'll call it world domination to be funny, but at least for this part to, to really take a majority market share in the major, what I think are going to be the major cannabis markets, right? Um, you've got California, which is huge because it, it's very legacy. You have Florida, which is massive. Um, Colorado is an interesting one because it's a large market, but most of the flour that's sold is house brands, 70% of it. So, you know, brands don't usually do well there. So it's an interesting market. You have Arizona. So that's one, two, and four that you guys have. Um, you know, are New York, New York and New Jersey high on the radar to go into, or are you already there? And I'm asking a stupid question. <laughs> well, so I can't disclose our expansion strategy, of course. Um, but what I can tell you is, and you see it, you've talked about it, is we have developed what we call our hub strategy, where we have a Southwest hub, we have a Northeast hub with Pennsylvania, we've got a presence in Connecticut, Massachusetts. Um, and then we have a Southeast hub where Florida is obviously the cornerstone state in that Arizona is the cornerstone state state in the Southwest. And then Pennsylvania right now is the cornerstone state in the Northeast. But um, within those hubs, obviously, we're going to look at attractive opportunities, both in terms of applications for licenses and in terms of expansion where it makes sense. So, I mean, I guess to answer your question, the harvest, the harvest merger, I'm sure will not be the last merger that truly, you know, undertakes, but we're doing it in a thoughtful way, not just a land grab, um, which I think is the old way of thinking, but much more in a, in a thoughtful, you know, following this hub model. Very cool. No, and I think it's a great strategy. I think a lot of companies are going to do that because, you know, listen, at the end of the day with a company, your size, when you go into a market, you, you you got to make money, right? I mean, at the end, that, that, that's mm-hmm. what people don't understand. Like I talk about the Florida market and, you know, people are talking about, they're like, how would you approach the Florida market? And I'm like, well, if I were to approach the Florida market, I would open up in one geography at a time and try to win that geography one at a time. But with a $55 million license, it doesn't allow you to do that strategy. And, and the reason being is because you exist, right? You, to go toe to toe with truly even Florida would just be stupid. Um, so on that point, you know, it being that big, like, I think the bigger markets are attractive to you because the returns are there. So, you know, I, I, I'm kind of rambling there, but I want to go back also towards the merger. So 
I am not a legal mind. Mm -hmm. To me, it's to say, hey, we this company and this company want to combine. We want to do that. It shouldn't seem shouldn't be too hard. Make sure that you know all the seats on the bus are filled. You get rid of the duplicates, get some severance package go and all that stuff. You know, right. how much more complicated is it in cannabis where you have companies that are operating in different states and there's all these different sub entities and everything else to make sure the licensure and the structure and all that is there. Does the regulatory environment of cannabis really make that a lot harder than other industries? Or is this something you've kind of seen before? You know, you said that a lot of the things that you guys were doing, it was were being done for the first time. You had nothing to go mm-hmm. off of. There was no model to repeat. And even if you look at other industries, they're not the same. So, you know, a, were you guys just kind of doing the things that made sense and, and talking to the regulators about why it made sense? Like how much harder was this than, than anything you've seen in the past? I mean, I, like I said, I think, I think it's, I think it is challenging because as you know, um, even within the various different States, you're oftentimes, uh, regulated even by a different type of mind, right? In some States you're regulated by a department of health which is a whole different mindset yeah. and a department of commerce. Um, they, they come at things with a different mindset. And so I do think because of the regulatory patchwork that our industry um, is governed by, I do think it makes things more challenging. And then the other oh. regulatory piece to this is something that applies across the board, which is um, the antitrust hurdles that you have to overcome. So the harvest true leave merger had to be approved by, uh, by you know, the federal regulators as well to make sure that it wasn't anti-competitive. Because when you have two large entities like that um, coming together, if it, you know, they do look at it for antitrust violations. And so we had to overcome that hurdle as well. And if you remember, if you know your cannabis history, um, you'll remember that Harvest tried to complete two significant mergers in 2019 that were held up by, it's called HSR review. Um, it's Hart Scott Redino Act, where they look at whether or not it's going to create an anti-competitive situation. And that particular review of those transactions in 2019 dragged out so long that our industry had changed so dramatically in that time period that those mergers no longer made sense for those companies, for harvest in those companies, and they ended up falling apart. Yeah. So, you know, the stars really all did align for the truly harvest merger. We made it through that com- anti-competitive hurdle with the HSR review. And then of course, getting through the various regulatory hurdles in each state. Um, but for that moving as quickly as it did, you know, in, in our industry, lots can change in six months. Yeah, it sure can. Um, that's crazy. I mean, it's it obviously... It makes sense, but it is crazy to me that the, although it is a federally illegal substance, um, it is mm-hmm. not legal federally. We can't get access to the safe banking, but they're going to tell you if it's going to be a monopoly or not. I mean, you know, that that's the crazy thing. They're going to sit here. Well, you can't sell it. You can't you can't do any of this stuff federally, but you better check with us to make sure that you're not going to create a monopoly on the cannabis industry. It just doesn't make sense to me. Obviously, those of us in the industry know that there are other large players out there. You have your Cure Leafs of the world. You have your Certeras and everything else. And I think some of those got to the size they are after your merger around the same time. So, you know, for the average citizen, I don't think it would have been an issue. But it still does blow my mind that that there are federal regulators that are involved in this. And yet we have such a hard time getting this federal legislation passed. Yeah, that's, um, you know. That, that's part of what makes me relevant, I guess, is that because of the regulation, I mean, you have to have lawyers that have to, to wade through all of that. But yeah, I mean, we that was the Department of Justice that weighed in on the Harvest and True Leave merger. And, and you, have to, you have to get over that hurdle um, with any large transaction of that size. And then, as you probably also know, um, a lot of the large cannabis companies are also have had to file with the SEC. Um, even though we're traded on the the Canadian stock exchange, we had to register with the SEC as well. So we have to have certain certain filings that we have to complete, even though we can't be traded on the New York stock exchange or the NASDAQ. So it's a, it, it, it's yeah, a shame. It, it, it's a it's, very complicated. It's a very complicated legal landscape. It's a shame too. It, for, it is a shame for U.S. Like, cannabis companies. I I think I think the stocks get 
murdered on the Canadian exchange because the average retail investor in the United States doesn't have access to them. Any kind of trading volume will, will throw the shares up or down. I mean, you look at, you look at any, any seasoned investor would look at, you know, um, all the, 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 they'd look at the charts of the cannabis companies and they'd say, Oh, these are all undervalued. You look at any other companies that put up the same numbers and the stocks are trading much higher. It, it, everything they're doing is making you guys not operate at, at full capacity. And obviously this is something that, that everybody knows. Um, you know, we, we, I made you kind of, I asked you to kind of speculate on what the Florida market would look like from a number standpoint. I obviously that's not something that falls in your wheelhouse. I do wonder, do you, tend to speculate on what federal legalization would look like from a compliance standpoint in order to kind of be prepared for it. And I, I imagine that's exponentially harder than what I asked you to do in Florida, because who fucking knows what they're going to do as far as regulatory compliance, they can literally do anything. They can pick any state to model it after they can be crazy about it. They can change it three times in the first year, right? At least with, with, estimating the revenue of Florida, you can be like, well, you know, 800,000 people, there's 30 million, we can do some math. Talk to me about what that looks like in your world where you try to anticipate what that's going to look like and how you prepare for it, you know, as general as you can, we don't need the, the secret sauce playbook. And then we'd have to put this to Patreon and charge for it if you're going to give that type of advice, but you know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a company of our size that's publicly traded, um, we're already complying with, you know, the regulations that apply to us. And so I think you just, you put that on steroids if federal legalization occurs. I mean, Todd, you pointed out, like we can't even get the Safe Banking Act passed. So I'm not sure um, how optimistic folks should be about federal federal uh, legalization since we can't even get the Safe, the safe Banking Act passed. But I mean, we have we already look at look at things you brought up California, for example, I mean, California has its own um, consumer privacy act that we have to follow because we do business there. I mean, I think people don't appreciate the, the fact that even though we are federally illegal, um, we still as you pointed out just in talking about the harvest truly merger, we still have to follow all of these federal regulations with regard to advertising and um, packaging and safety, OSHA, of course, applies to us. So I'm not really sure on the regulatory front how much, obviously it'll be a change because it will be a new regulator regulating us. But, you know, I'm not sure how much more complicated it could possibly be than this patchwork that we already um, comply with. It's so interesting. I, I mean, and I say that as I feel like a lot of what you do in your line of work, especially with True Leaf now, is you, you're paving, you're going down paths that nobody's gone down before because you are one of the bigger ones and you're innovating a lot. Like you said, even the merger was one of those, right? Um, does it ever, like, I only imagine, and, and obviously you guys are a lot smarter than this, so I'm generalizing, but it's like you go down the path, you figure out what the regulatory compliance is for local municipality, city, county, all the way up to the state level, and everything is good to go. And someone comes in, it's like, well, if you looked at these federal regulations and you're like, wait, what? Wait, what, well, wait, why do we have to worry about those? Like, wait, we're, it's only in the state. Like, you know, is it ever because you guys are doing this for the first time where all of a sudden a group of regulators come out of nowhere? They're like, wait, we didn't talk to you yet. Well, I mean, I think for us, I mean, we're sophisticated enough that we have, in addition to lawyers, we also have government relations folks that keep their eye on things like that. And you, you said it yourself. I mean, local regulations sometimes can be as stifling or more stifling than something at a state level or even federal level. Um, you gotta, you have to be in compliance with all of those and have relationships all at all levels um, to be able to get your business done. Very cool. I know I mean, this is you. You brought up you brought up California a, a bit ago, and I mean California is a perfect example of that, where there are local regulations that you know, can slow you down just as much as a state, you know, a state regulatory problem or, you know, for us, federal is, is less of an issue, but make no mistake in, in places like California, those cities are calling the shots. Yes. A hundred percent. DCC is, I mean, I'll say that they're kind of a pain in the butt. Like 
in California, I don't think people realize how deep those stupid regulations go, like all the way down to trade sampling. Like, for example, I'm a new brand that's launching, right? So when we go into a new store, we want to make bud tenders can sample the products and everybody knows it, right? You, you work for mm -hmm. a restaurant, you have to sample the menu. It's forced on you. You have to know the menu. You have to know the, the, the specials and everything else. So I want the bud tenders to be familiar with our product. When it comes to samples, I literally am allowed to send, I think, four quantities of a particular skew to a store i can tell you if the store only has four bud tenders i'm probably not working with them they're gonna have a lot more you know you know how many bud tenders you've had in harvest right so you know right. obviously as i have new product and i want to get it to the buyers maybe it kind of makes sense but even as something is just making sure that all the bud tenders in the store were able to have access to my product it could take me a week if not longer and then i have to pay distribution fees every time i send mm -hmm. that to the store and it just i don't understand why i guess maybe they're trying to keep me from sending out product for free and, and promoing it but i don't think people realize how deep into the frontline job roles that some of these regulations go and i'm sure you've seen stuff even more complicated than, than this at all levels yeah, I mean, as you pointed out, I mean, oftentimes if, if you have the time, you can work through these various various regulations and accomplish your business object objective. But in our industry, time, you know, I remember a, a person that I used to work with at Harvest used to say, time kills deals. And I think in our industry, no, no statement is probably more apt is that time kills a lot of things that we're trying to accomplish in our industry because I we move so quickly. I don't think anybody's more familiar than that with that than you who two major deals were killed before you were finally able to get the one going. Uh, it's, it's a hundred percent. No, I mean, that's true. It's a hundred percent true. So, I mean, you know, who knows, maybe it was for the best and that now you guys got the right dance partner with you and, and, you know, it's a great organization. Mm -hmm. I will tell you just based on personal experience, I'm, I'm happy that you didn't have to move to Tallahassee. I'm sure you feel the same way. <laughs> I've actually never been to Tallahassee. I'm going this summer. Um, when I come down to the Sea Lab uh, panel, I'm actually going to go to Tallahassee for a visit. I'm excited to go there. And and like I said before, and I, and I mean I I mean this 100% sincerely is that I do believe that the two companies are very complementary to one another. And so you know, for me, it's been a great. I'm lucky. It's been a great, it's been a great merger as far as I'm concerned. No, I, I kid you will love Tallahassee. I spent four years there at Florida state university. It's one of the most beautiful campuses that I've ever seen. Um, outside of the campus and capital area, it gets interesting, but you know, Tallahassee is fun. <laughs> I personally would recommend going in fall during football season. So you can catch a game at the amazing Dote Campbell stadium. Um, I think it's only a matter of time before there is a true leaf box at that stadium. And that will be a day that I will be very happy about. <laughs> well, and, and like I said, I mean, I, I've only been to Florida on vacation one time, so I do need to spend a little bit more time there. I love Arizona. Um, this is not my home. I'm a transplant here, but um, the state has been very good to me. So I like it here. The main difference between Florida and Arizona is when it's hot during the day at Arizona, it tends to cool down a little bit at night. When it's hot during the day in Florida, it's still hot at night. So that's the warning that I would, <laughs> I would give agree you. With you. Yeah, I would agree with you, except for in Arizona, by the time August rolls around, I think the core of the earth is hot because it's been 110 plus for a month. So it doesn't, it's a different heat. When they say it's a dry heat, it actually, there is something to that. Yeah. No, California got the weather somehow. They got the weed and the weather, but, mm -hmm. you know, we'll catch up to them in other places. Um, <laughs> listen, we're really excited to have you down for the conference. I mean, I'm excited now. I, I thought I was going to have to talk you into it, but yeah. you're already coming. I think it's going to be a great event. You know, as as you look forward to 2022 and the expansions to True Leaf, what are some of the things that, you're excited about whether it's just for the cannabis industry in general or, or specifically for you and your team at truly if that obviously you are allowed to talk about yeah i mean i think if if anybody has ever gone through a merger before um you know we're definitely i guess we're what five months into this process maybe closer to six um and there's there's aches and pains associated with with integrating 
teams. I mean, we're not just integrating the harvest and true leaf cultures together, but true leaf made acquisitions in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. of Pure Pin and Salivo and Keystone Shops also in 2021. So there's a lot of cultures coming together. And I think that we're, if you think about it kind of like, I guess this would be appropriate to Florida um, tornadoes, like we're in sort of, we're in, I think sort of the, the critical part of that where things are really swirling around and there's a lot of change going on. Um, but I think once, once we do integrate all of these different cultures, I think, you know, the sky is the limit in terms of the things we can accomplish, but we're definitely in the sausage making phase right now where you're just kind of mashing everything together. But I think it's gone as well as, as everyone was anticipating it, it would. Yeah. Change, you know, change is hard. Are um, change is hard. No, you're good. Um, this industry is a really interesting one. I feel like there's a lot of curmudgeons in this industry to a point, right? They look at the bigger companies in the industry and they realize, ah, oh, corporate cannabis, blah, blah, blah. But if you're going to acquire someone, especially if you're going to acquire them with their operators, like, mm -hmm. I think some people, once they get past the initial curmudgeon and they get in, they're like, wait, we can do what we've been doing and we'll have the capital to do it. And we're going to have support. Oh, and you guys are going to standardize the Holy shit. I honestly feel like at this point, four to six months in where they're like, all right, you know, Hey, I want to be honest with you. I thought you guys were going to suck, but it's awesome. Like, I feel like there's a lot of that going on in the industry right now where, you know, companies, I don't want to say they're giving up, but they're ready to cash in on the sweat equity that they've been putting in for a long time. They want to continue to operate their business. And I think the smart move is to do a merger or do a, a partial exit or whatever it is. And I, I have to say, I imagine if you talk to those folks afterwards, that that's where there are. They were like, listen, we were kind of hesitant about it before, but now we realize that we get to do what we do. And we have, we don't have to have the anxiety of constantly raising capital or running out of cash, or even just trying to figure out our next move that, that the attitudes are very different after that happens. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I think you see that at True Leave. Um, certainly, there are plenty of Harvest people, myself included, Steve White, our investor relations person. There are several people from Harvest that are still in very important roles. And I think the same is true with some of the other uh, acquisitions that True Leave has done. They definitely are, you know, continuing to remain engaged with those folks and to make sure that the integrations go smoothly and. And you don't want to lose access to people that have relationships in the markets where you've just acquired assets. Yeah. Um, that wouldn't be very smart. And so I think, you know, truly is, is handling their business in a very smart way. Yeah. It, it, it is almost to me, like, it's almost like a strategic investor at this point, as weird as that sounds, where it's, you know, you're, you guys see a company that may not be doing as well as they, they could be doing, and, and you're going to come in with capital and, and resources and allow them to do that, right? The intention is not to, to cut their head off, is to enable them to continue what they're doing, but better, and that would be why you're acquiring them. I think because there is a lot of distrust in this industry that people tend to, to miss that, so... You know, it, it is interesting to see how it's going forward. And, you know, I'm very excited to see how the, mm -hmm. how truly changes and stays culturally relevant. I'm really excited to see some of the brands that you guys are taking on, whether it be through acquisition or really just strategic partnership. Um, obviously, being here in Florida, I'm partial to the ones that mm -hmm. come down here. But, you know, I think that's that's something really excited to go on. So. <laughs> We've been, I've taken up over a half, 40 minutes of your time. And I know that you have places to go and people to see. So I will let you go. And we're really excited to have you down here. Like I said, on June 3rd and 4th at Mana and Wynwood, everybody. Um, before I let you go, is there any words of wisdom you want to leave us with? Any promotions, trueleave.com, anything that you'd like to get out there before we let you go? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I never expected to be in this industry. Again, if you had told me this three years ago, I would have thought you were crazy. I've now almost been in this industry three years. And for anybody who's who's looking to engage with our industry, like there is never a dull moment. I never wake up any day and say, oh, I'm going to be, as you pointed out, I'm going to be bored today. Um, there's always so much excitement going on. And um, just the ability to, to bring products to people that can, can change their lives for the better. I mean, I think it's, it's a very rewarding thing and, and I like to fix things and I like to build things. So working for a company that is, is really in this phase of growth has just been, it's been so. 
Very cool. Really love it. The last thing I'm going to ask you, and this is something I think I've noticed recently, or at least I just came up with a way to describe it recently, is I feel like this industry has a lot of people in it that that they're, I don't want to say they're fed, maybe kind of fed up with their other industries and maybe they're cannabis enthusiasts or not, but they come here and I feel like they operate better because they're a little bit more relaxed. Our industry is a little bit more, I feel like our industry is full of a lot of people who are sick of the bullshit of other industries and they come here looking to start over looking to find like-minded people and I, I tell you part of the reason I started this podcast is because I would go to these events and I would just have these amazing conversations with folks just like this and everybody from from your CEO Kim all the way down to the people in the in god if you call up the Delray Beach Truly and they ask hey is Todd shop there they'd be like yeah that dude does not shut the f up ever he's in here for an hour every time he comes but my point being is i just feel like that's the general consensus of this industry you being at a very big law firm which tends to be very buttoned up politics and everything else do you feel like this industry is just a little bit lighter when it comes to that than everywhere else yeah i mean i do i think there are, are different people in this industry i think there's some people that are true lovers of the plant and believers in the plant. Um, and those people are in our industry. I also think it's an industry that, you know, by its very nature, we welcome people who are, you know, on a second chance. Mm -hmm. um, that's what our industry is, is kind of all about. Yeah. And by no means is our industry perfect, but I feel like this is the industry that's working on it and, and hopefully will soon be a model for, for the others when it comes to inclusivity and, and everything else. So Nicole, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Really appreciate the conversation today. And uh, I guess we're gonna see you down here in, in June. Yep, I'll be there. I look forward to it. Awesome. All right, thank you to Nicole and thank you to everybody else at home, folks. Again, join us on the 23rd, that's going to be a Wednesday. Typically we're on Thursday. So the 23rd at 7 PM, if you go to the cannabis lab event, bright page, or you go to join clab.com, you can find information that is our cannabis crypto NFTs and web three panel. Really exciting. Um, we will be the, uh, we will have our next event in April on April 21st, day after 420, a little day to recover. And of course, folks, we have the conference. It is going to be the best event cannabis event in Florida of the year. I think Truly is going to be very involved in it too. So be there June 3rd and 4th, get your tickets. I'll be there. Truly will be there. Ricky Williams will be there. Everyone's going to be there. It's going to be a whole lot of fun, folks. This has been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. We'll see you next time.